Thank you for coming to session three of the 2021 virtual conference. Uh, this session is promoting environmental justice, the first steps. Uh, this virtual conference is put on by the Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts. I am Sarah Grady, the South Shore Regional Coordinator for the Massachusetts Bay's National Estuary Partnership and Watershed Ecologist for one of the WA member organizations the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. The Watershed Action Alliance works to protect and improve the health of the waterways and watersheds of the region for people, wildlife, and the environment. And it has multiple member organizations throughout Southeastern Massachusetts. WA has quite a few sponsors and supporters. We would like to thank our Eagle level sponsor, the Island Foundation as well as our Osprey level sponsors, the NSRWA, North and South Rivers Watershed, <laughs> Horsley Witten Group, and Three Birds Consulting. We also, as you can see, have many other supporters, including individual donors. If you would like to donate to help support the Watershed Action Alliance, there is a link in the chat um, and you can donate there. Uh, we would like to uh, extend a special thanks to the Island Foundation for their support of this workshop series, as well as for uh, the Watershed Action Alliance itself. Um, so uh, we would like to present this uh, hand-carved red-bellied cooter, which is an endangered species that lives in rivers and ponds of our region, to Andrea Bogolamini, the program officer for the Island Foundation. Uh, this sculpture was hand-carved by Lee Poulis of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. Uh, so Andrea, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, hopefully you can hear me and this works okay. First, thank you so much. Um, I, I follow in Sarah Kelly's footsteps as the program officer here, and I know she's worked in the past quite a bit um, um, with WA and putting together um, this idea of, of really thinking about equity and, and justice. So I just wanna say that first and um, just how much we appreciate as the foundation, the work that's being done and that we are such a proud supporter. So nice work and thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea, and for all of your support. Before we get started, we would also like to acknowledge the lands that our speakers are speaking from and uh, where many of us are sitting right now. Uh, these are the tribal lands of multiple tribes, including the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, the Nauset, and the Narragansett tribes. So we wanted to remind you that this is a webinar. You can't be seen or heard as an attendee, but you should be able to hear our speakers and see them and any slides that they're sharing. Uh, if you have questions for our speakers, we're gonna be answering questions at the end, uh, as well as maybe via the Q&A throughout. Um, but you can please use the Q&A on the bottom, uh, which is the two little bubbles. Uh, to submit questions to our speakers. Please do not use the chat to submit your questions. We're gonna be using the chat for technical issues if you have them, as well as making some posts with links to resources. The other attendees are not gonna be able to see uh, your chat messages or your questions until they're answered. We also are not using the raise hand option. So again, you're gonna not use raise hands in the middle, use Q&A, which is on the right uh, and chat on the left is where you'll be seeing um, important links. I would just like to introduce our uh, session. Uh, thank you for coming to our third and final session of our conference. In the first two sessions, we covered information and experiences to help you understand environmental justice. And in this session, we're gonna help you begin the long journey of addressing environmental injustices. So in our first session, what is environmental justice? Our speakers covered basic material, including the factors that are used to identify EJ communities and where these communities are located, and an overview of the issues in the region that involve water and healthy watersheds. Session two concentrated on a particular EJ issue, which is that of public access to recreational waters. Our attendees heard from two speakers who have experienced inequities in access and work are working towards solutions. 
The third speaker presented her research showing how science and data collection can assist in the removal of barriers to access by understanding usage trends and the reasons for them. So many of you are attending this session because you believe it is not enough to know what environmental injustice is and where it, and why it exists, you'd like to promote environmental justice. So in this final session, we'll be learning how to start this process. First, by becoming an anti-racist. We have three speakers today. The first is Don Williams, who will be sharing some of his personal experiences. He is president of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. He'll be followed by Melissa Ferretti, who is the chair lady of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe, who will also be sharing some of her personal experiences. And then we will be getting a taste of how to start our path toward anti-racism with Livia Davis of C4 Innovations. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Don Williams. Thank you all for being interested enough to come to this. Uh, I'd first like to express my thanks to my co-panelists, Melissa Ferretti and Livia Davis for helping me to make this journey. I'm so very grateful to both of you for broadening my thinking on this important subject. We have three panelists in this session. I will lead off, but before I tell you what I've learned that might be helpful for you, you might ask why I've chosen to follow this path. The simple answer is that equity in our society is a very important issue. The founding fathers did not successfully address it. The reconstruction era provided yet another opportunity for rectification, but no solution. The civil rights movement built a legal framework but failed to address the key underlying issues. In today's world, I feel we are more divided than uni united. I feel that our separation threatens to yet further divide and weaken our society. Despite the idealistic proclamations of the Declaration of Independence, all men are still not equal. This is hypocritical at best and patently unfair at worst. Why should we all work hard to achieve better interracial understanding? The simple answer is that it is a benefit to us to do so. For example, problem solving groups strongly profit from diverse ideas. We are currently excluding the input of millions because they are different from us. And there is no shortage of complex problems to be solved. Our panelists have been carefully chosen to promote discussion of how we might become more inclusive to the betterment of our quality of life. Our goal is to provide ideas that each of you might consider in order to become equity advocates. So I am the newbie of the three panelists and that I have taken Equity 101, the basic course, and we'll suggest some approaches that I have used in thinking about promoting equity that work for me. Melissa Ferretti, passionate and eloquent advocate of equity, will tell her story. And our expert on promoting constructive conflict, Livia Davis, will provide resources and insights into advanced equity. First, my story. I went to Brown University where I, be, I became a lifelong liberal. Not a surprising outcome at a university that actively promoted and proudly highlighted its diversity. It didn't really bother me that the blacks at Brown sat only with each other at meals and didn't seem to make much of an effort to reach out. Aha, so. Your red flag banners are undoubtedly going up the flagpole, but it took me 50 plus years to confront my own prejudice. My long overdue journey began when Melissa Ferretti, Hampton Watkins and I first met with Livia Davis, Chief Learning Officer of the C4 Innovations Company. Melissa knew Livia and thought we should vet her as a panel member for this webinar. Little did we know that we were going to be cross-examined also. Livia was tough. Her first question of us was, is your group really committed to fighting racism and promoting equity? Well, we vigorously assured her that we were. Really, she said. 
She scoffed at our naivety at thinking that there was something that we could do to make everything better. She firmly cautioned us that this is a difficult problem requiring much time and dedication. I had first met Melissa when she attended our precinct eight town meeting caucus, arguing forcefully, passionately and eloquently in front of us that at town meeting, we should support Plymouth returning a Wampanoag cemetery to the tribe. Frank discussions have followed between us and she suggested that I read Brooks's book Lisa Brooks's book, Our Beloved Kin, A New History of King Philip's War. This book was written from the Native American perspective. Thanksgiving will never be the same for me. I had my first eureka moment while reading Colson Whitehead's haunting book, The Nickel Boys. Uh, we will provide you with my reading list. The Nickel Boys is a fictional account based on a real life reform school in Florida that was especially hard on its black contingent. As I was reading, I caught myself disparaging, mentally disparaging these blacks for not speaking proper English and for being loud and exuberant. Livia was delighted when I told her. She said, you have taken the first step. The first step was to admit that I am prejudiced. This frank self-examination was quite uncomfortable for a Brown University educated liberal. I had to confront that my prejudice was very ingrained. The second step was the realization that the process of making a difference was going to be long and difficult. How was I to write reverse my own ingrained teachings, much less those of others? Me, I was prejudiced. But then I remembered history and my own experience provides many examples of people looking for differences with others to prove their own superiority. I recalled my readings about the Incas, Aztecs and North American indigenous peoples that highlighted the inequities of European colonialism and white entitlement. About this time, Livia invited me to attend one of her C4 webinars, Roadmap to Racial Equity in Behavioral Health and Recovery Organizations. I admit, I was looking for something I could do. Instead, I found two valuable takeaways, the third and fourth steps. The third step was the realization that the initial dialogue between the diverse groups was going to be uncomfortable. There would be many misunderstandings. There would be unintentional offenses taken. Both shot sides should be willing to be honest about what is offensive and willing to be uncomfortable together. The webinar involved an hour of listening to minorities speak frankly about their feelings. It was probably the first time that I had had a lengthy face-to-face -face exposure of this kind. The fourth step was that I noticed that immersion either by meeting in person or by extensive reading leads to higher levels of understanding of different cultures and encourages in-depth self-examination. Melissa led me to the fifth and sixth steps. We talked about the life of indigenous peoples and she recommended that I read Louise Erdrich's book the Night Watchman. This book highlights the value of working with nature rather than trying to control it. The Native Americans have certainly gotten that message right. The fifth step was the insight that many of the differences between cultures are usually not deal breakers nor major character flaws. So they are really more indicator, not indicators of inferiority. The sixth step taught me that other cultures may even have better ideas about learning and happiness. If you need proof, read Keisha's, Blaine's, and Ibram Kendi's 400 Souls, an ex excellent history of US Blacks by Black authors. I suspect that each one of you needs to find your own journey. One size does not fit all. The process will most certainly involve uncomfortable self-examination 
And one might also greatly profit from immersion in a different culture via reading, listening, or, dis or discussion. I am still at the very beginning of my journey. I am eager to learn from Melissa and from Livia what I must do in order to progress, to make a difference. Fortunately, both are here and will speak next. Moniki Sak, Don, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank WAA, uh, Watershed Action Alliance, for having me and to my fellow panelists and to all of you for attending. Um, you know, living today as a Wampanoag woman in leadership, I can't say that I'm an expert on all things about Native Americans. There is no manual and every community's struggle is unique from one another. But the one thing I do know is fishing, <laughs> hunting and gathering and what it means as Mama Verna, an elder of the Herring Pond tribe who raised me in Cedarville on Herring Pond would say is living off the fat of the land. These memories are deeply ingrained for me as a small child growing up with those uh, very same values as my, my children doing the same. Their father was so very proud um, of his wife's heritage and that his sons had uh, ancestral uh, indigenous history and, and he was really proud of their Aboriginal rights. He would proudly announce it no matter where we went to fish or, or, or to hunt, et cetera. And he made sure that his, his sons um, and myself would assert that right. He was non-native, but you'd never know that. My sons had a fishing pole in their hands since they were toddlers. Like myself growing up, we were always on the water whether by the bay, the beach, on the canal, or my all-time favorite love, of course, Herring Pond, where I grew up. Whether we were digging quags, what you might call quahogs, scalloping with my, my very handy homemade viewfinder that I created and made myself, clamming, oystering in the R months, of course, scup fishing, bass fishing, or flippy fishing, what you call fluke or flounder. We even went night crawler hunting on the reg <laughs> at night, of course, for the biggest, fattest worms you could ever, never, ever buy at a bait store. Being born with a fishing pole in my son's hands, as we call it, both of my sons are avid fishermen and hunters. But my firstborn, Dan, he is that guy. It is in his DNA and he loves to fish. Hard worker up at 4 a.m. just so he can cast a line in that canal and maybe get some food for his table. Racism comes in many forms. Being mixed race, I can certainly say that myself, my tribe, my family, we have experienced it firsthand often. Sometimes we say things without even thinking that might be racist to someone. We're all guilty of that, I'm sure. Unfortunately for my son, when he is out fishing, just about every time he fishes or he, he's down the canal or, or just doing something that he really, really loves and it's very important to him, reminds him of his father who's no longer with us. He's always approached, he's harassed, he's questioned. I may say, you know, there have been some unpleasant conversations over the years with maybe some EPOs and the police officers. But as of the last few years, we've been very fortunate. The environmental police are very understanding and accepting of our rights to hunt, fish, gather, etc. cetera. Uh, the DNRs, it depends on which town you're in, but the Department of Natural Resources often are less, less knowledgeable in that area, again, depending on what town you're in. But as I said, on any given day, he may be approached. Um, but I must say the biggest, the biggest offenders are, are the public and the people that come down that aren't even officials. Once being told 
because he has blonde hair and blue eyes that he didn't look like a Wampanoag. He's even occasionally, because of his blonde hair and blue eyes, been questioned by other indigenous people as to why he's fishing in an indigenous area. Apparently, there's a misconception that indigenous people are only a certain color, I guess. One day he was shell fishing and a couple of people had approached him over the day, one being a native person, one being a non-native person. He got a bunch of grief that day. The man called, threatened to call the DNR, call the police, and he just, very passive, my son is, he just kind of nonchalantly told them, go ahead, give them a call. So his day went on, he fished away that day. And when he got back in his vehicle, this is something I don't talk about. And when my son told me about it, I think I was so hurt by it that I, I didn't, didn't even want to talk more about it. But he got in his vehicle at the end of that day, and there was a piece of paper that had been thrown in his window of his van that said fake Indian on it. Not in any way, shape, or form is he required to validate to anyone, including the officers, to be honest. We show them our identification out of respect. We're not required to. He simply says, if you have a problem again, call the police. Well, that day really hurt me because I thought about my son and how he felt doing something that he absolutely loves, something that's his inherent born right to do. And he was questioned and offended by this sign that got thrown in his vehicle. We don't know who put it there, whether it was a non-native or a native person. Racism can come in many forms. So don't be that person. Educate yourself. Before you assume or decide to berate someone, including indigenous people who may be watching this today, there's no way a person looks because of their color or because of the color of their eyes. This is my son who was recently highlighted in the Cape Cod Times. Blonde hair, blue eyes, indigenous man who loves, absolutely loves what he does when he's fishing. Take a good look next time you approach someone and ask them about that. Thank you so much for listening. Hi everybody, this is Livia Davis. I am from C4 Innovations. I want to say thank you to Don and thank you for to Melissa for those remarks. I want to begin by saying that as a white woman that immigrated to the, to, um, the U.S. from Denmark in 1981, I have been and very much continue to be on a journey to understand all the layers of racism and how to dismantle them. What I will be talking about today are some additional early steps for you to consider in this work. I loved how Don laid out his beginning steps and I want to just emphasize again, one of his steps, the importance of frank self-examination. Unless we are willing to understand our own racism, we cannot dismantle it. Uh, understanding our own race, racism can be hard because we don't wanna be seen as a racist. And that can be hard to kind of say, I'm a racist, right? We don't wanna be seen as one. We don't wanna understand ourselves as one. But if we can maybe begin to look at uh, that from the point of view that we are all impacted by a white dominant culture that we live in, then maybe we can start normalizing talking about our own racism because that it really is the beginning step, you know, to really say, what are my prejudices? What are my racist tendencies? Because it's a, it's a universal experience. The second thing I want to emphasize up front is, you know, please resist the following urge if it arises in you. What we often find when we work with people on anti-racist strategies is this idea that, could you just tell me how to be an anti-racist and what my agency needs to do and, and to promote racial equity and behavior? And, and even just kind of being given, you know, the tools or the frameworks or this is how you do it so you can kind of check it off is a way, a kind of a, a white dominant way of looking at, at getting things accomplished. So if you do kind of get that urge, know that it's completely normal. That's one of my initial kind of reactions was, yes, I don't wanna be in a racist, just tell me how to do it. It requires a lot of internal work as well. 
So I am happy to share some steps I've learned to take those steps. But please know that the parallel work, it's like a, if you think about a railroad, a t- to railroad tracks, parallel, parallel tracks of internally dismantling any mental models of racism you have combined with taking action is key to transformation. It needs to be both. Please don't take action before you've done some of the internal work to dismantle some of the mental models. Now that can be hard, but that's my request. So lastly, before getting into some of the kind of explanation of some of the terms, if you're a white person, please recognize the emotional tax, the extra labor and burden that black indigenous and people of color can face when talking about racism and oppression. I hope you'll make the commitment to understand the history and present day impacts of racism. And I hope you will not ask one person to speak for a whole person, whole people. I know Melissa was just say, saying that as well. You, no one person can be an expert for a whole people. And I hope that you won't ask that one person to educate you about the impact of racism and how to dismantle it, unless, unless that is what the person is trained to do and is interacting with you in that role. Sometimes as white people, I'll speak for myself, I was hoping that some of my people, my friends of color would say, would tell me, you know, how do I, how do I become an anti-racist? And that can be a real burden for somebody who is non-white. So let's start by defining some key terms. And then I urge you to learn many, much more about these terms. Um, and I hope that collectively you want to take some action. Now in your resource list, you will have a whole glossary that has different terms. So I'm just going to go through a couple of them just to kind of get us started. So race as a first step. It's this idea that the human species is divided into distinct groups on the basis of physical differences only. So race is really a social and political concept uh, that was created in the 17th century by white Europeans to justify the enslavement of Africans and the spread of colonialism. It is a social and a political concept There isn't more than one race. There's only one human race. Um, So this is really something that was done in order to really look at how do you best conserve power for some people who have a different skin pigment than others. So that's race. White privilege, the power and advantages that benefit perceived white people derived from a historical oppression and exploitation of other non-white groups. So white privilege doesn't mean that your life hasn't been hard. And we hear that a lot when we talk to white people and say, look, my, my life has been hard too. What it means, it doesn't mean that your life may not have been hard. It means that your skin color isn't one of the things making it harder. So again, white privilege is a lot of the things that benefit you because of your skin color. So the other thing to talk about a little bit is equality. We, we talk a lot about, we hear a lot that folks, well, we want equality for everyone, right? We want diversity, inclusion, and equality. And equality is typically defined as treating everyone the same and giving everyone access to the same opportunities. That's equality. So equity is really this idea about you need fair treatment and access and opportunity and advancement for all people, while at the same time, you want to strive to look at what are the barriers and how do you eliminate them? Because if you don't, you know, you won't have the full participation of some groups. So equality and equity, equity really looks at saying, okay, what is it that we may need to eliminate as a barrier in order for folks to be able to fully participate in the opportunities that everyone enjoys? And if you then take this one step further and talk about racial equity, just to kind of put that in there as well, it's the condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicted in a statistical sense how one fares. So it's really, it's this idea that if you look at all the statistics for people of color, we know that the outcomes, socioeconomic outcomes, health outcomes, 
they're all uh, uh, not nearly as good as for white people. Okay, so go to the next slide, please. So the other thing to start at is just to introduce you to a couple of frameworks on how to really you know, guide you in this work. There are, there are many frameworks out there and I'll just introduce you to two. So Ibrahim Kendi uh, wrote a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. He's now at Boston University. He has been part of creating a center that really looks at how do you become an anti-racist? How do you really look at uh, implementing racial equity? And he talks about, you know, five steps here. And one of them, as you can see, is acknowledging your own racism, which both Don and I have touched on. And then he takes it one step further. He says, confess your racist ideas. And this can be hard and it can be powerful. But when you shine a light on things that hide in the darkness that maybe you're not so comfortable with or that you might be actually ashamed of, especially with others on the same journey with you, their power and hold over you will lessen. That's what we are seeing, that's what we're learning. So shine the light on it. That can be hard again, because this is work that makes one feel vulnerable. He also talks about the importance of, of uh, identifying key terms or defining them. And we did just a little bit about that earlier um, and in how to really work to change racist systems and policies, which we won't get into today, but again, Here's just a very simple but powerful framework for you to think about how to do this work. And the next one. So a guide to the accountability of equity results framework. At C4 Innovations, where I work, this is the framework that we use. It was developed by the NEE Casey Foundation for a lot of our work. And before kind of diving into taking some of these steps, we with communities, people who come to us to say, you know, work with us to kind of uh, implement these frameworks, what we do is we work with communities to support them to be ready for the work. You know, our leaders on, on the board committed, uh, you know, is do you have the right people at the table, the people most impacted by any solutions you want to create, are they part at, at the table to help define the issue and also to co-create solutions? Do you have, um, you know, resources committed to doing the work? Um, and uh, are, are those resources equal to commitments of other strategic priorities for your agency or your system or community? So we do some pre-work to make sure that folks are ready. And as you can see from this list of activities on the slide, there are many steps you can take uh, and you need to start with data. This is, and I'll just kind of get into one bullet of here. I don't want to read all of it, but if you really, you know, think about data, data must inform your strategies and the NEE Casey Foundation framework lays out the importance of not only disaggregating data to differentiate the population that is most marginalized, but also for you to analyze the factors and patterns that perpetuate disparities. So we look to disaggregate data because programs and intervention and since strategies and actions must work for the people that are farthest for the desired results because all people really needs to be in all people. So for example, if you are working in a program uh, you're, and you really wanna make sure that everyone in your community can access your services or access your waterways, then if you really say that, you know, our mission is to serve all people, then let's start by the people who are furthest from achieving the results that you promote as, a, as an agency and say, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that those furthest from the desired results that you want to achieve can achieve them? And by looking at the data, you will be able to look at, okay, what are, what are those groups? And how can we start to analyze the factors and patterns that continue to perpetuate disparities? So that's a lot, but I just wanted to kind of share the idea. So let's go to the other page, please. So let's take, uh, you know, some possible steps for you to consider. You know, this is just kind of uh, talking a little bit about with Don and Dory and everyone and Melissa, you know, so again, you might want to consider, okay, let's take some time to define terms and language. You know, and again, you have some readings in the reading list, you could look at that. Develop a reading list. Don has already started one. Commit to doing this work long-term. This uh, can't underestimate uh, how important it is to make a commitment to doing this long-term. The commitment, 
you know, can be uh, also strengthened by doing it with groups of people who hold each other accountable to not give up because there will be a time in this process where you're just when I feel like you want to throw in the towel. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. I always say that being uncomfortable has gotten a bad reputation because we don't like to feel uncomfortable, but that's where the magic and the growth happens. And so we need to really look at creating containers and rules for the engagement to let people kind of be uncomfortable and stretch while still being uh, kind of supported in that work. It has to be safe. It has to be respectful. Start with inner work before jumping to concrete action. And there are many ways to start, you know, and one concrete way to, to kind of start is with this uh, process we're gonna go through in just a minute, to give you an example called white dominant culture and something different. It's a worksheet that you can use. It's uh, we're gonna give just a sn snippet of it, but it's a great um, um, worksheet to kind of think through, okay, where might I actually be racist and where could I do something different? Involve people most impacted in the leadership of this work. Make sure that people most impacted are at the table. Commit to having conversations to further racial equity and consider getting a facilitator because it can be hard. Okay, so what you can see here is a, just a little snippet of uh, this, this article um, that really talks about what could you personally do or to make a change or pivot from the left column to the right column, or what can your organization do? So you can see that if we talk about white dominant culture, there are things that are normal or that are norms of the white dominant culture. And so uh, one of the, the, the norms of white dominant culture is either or thinking, believing people are racist or not racist, good or bad. Um, so again, if you can look at maybe instead saying, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of patterns that have come from the system, the culture that I'm in. Can I look at the, all those patterns that influence me? And can I hold contradictory thoughts and feelings simultaneously? Where am I racist? Where am I not racist, right? So again, this idea of being either or thinking black or white is a very white dominant culture norm or paternalism, no consultation of transparency in decision-making. You know, is there a board that makes decision in your program or agency uh, and you, you're not transparent about how those decisions are made or they're made with a select group of people without everybody being involved, right? And you can see something different is this idea about partnership and where you really are clear about how our decisions being made, you're transparent, you have evaluations, frontline communities are respected and nurtured, power hoarding you know again this idea from the white dominant culture is that you know a lot of white dominant culture leaders they sometimes think they have to hold on to knowledge in order to keep their power or um you know people who are giving ideas from grassroots or from the bottom up so to speak in an, in an agency are treated as a threat so they steal their ideas so this idea is maybe can we move towards power sharing and so that may look different depending on what community or agency that you're in. So there's a long list of this, but what we do with folks is we, we go through them and we say, okay, give us examples of this where this shows up in your personal life and where it shows up in your work life or in your civil, civic life or your volunteer life. So this one, um, you can see here's just a couple more uh, uh, examples. One of them I'll just say is fear of open conflict. What we fear, uh, what we hear a lot, not fear a lot, is that, um, yes, I'm willing to talk about racism, but it has to be in a way that makes me comfortable. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to uh, make other people uncomfortable either. So um, when you have constructive conflict, when you have rules for the road that really helps to have these conversations, provides the container, then you can be okay with uh, making people uncomfortable because we have to be uncomfortable because what really is happening is we're upending, uh, I'm speaking for, as a white person, upending a lot of our mental models and that's uncomfortable. So, um, you know, it, it would be good to kind of move from, you know, fear of open conflict. We, we want to avoid it at all cost to instead saying, you know what, let's call on each other. Let's have the rules for the road of how to provide constructive feedback so that we can continuously learn from each other. So that's just one other example. 
Um, so this worksheet is available via this webinar, and it was adapted by, uh, of, of, by, uh, from a um, article called White Supremacy Culture by Tima Okun and Kenless Jones. And I just wanna urge you to also read that article. Okay, so then finally, for the next slide, I'm happy to share some sample communications agreements for your consideration. When we have courageous conversations about race, we are going to experience discomfort and conflict and disagreements. And I can tell you as a white person that there's been times where I'm like, oh, I don't wanna continue this, this is hard, right? But it's so important to continue uh, because in those conversations, that with it, that's where the magic happens. You know, if we have provided that container for those conversations, then being uncomfortable is just such a way to move forward. It's where growth happens and we should embrace it, not run from it. Um, so here are just some sample rules from the road. Uh, speak your truth, stay engaged, uh, experience discomfort, experience it. Uh, you know, honor all experience and expertise equally. Uh, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to look at people with many uh, kind of titles behind them or, uh, you know, so, so, you know, as more uh, of an expert, sometimes that's true, that's, that sometimes is, you know, it's not. Again, it looks at, you know, what does experience and expertise, what is valued, so please honor all of them equally. Um, so even just looking at that can be very important. So the goal is not to agree, it is to gain a deeper understanding. And then I just wanna leave you with this last quote from Ben Hecht, where he uh, really stresses the importance of conflict. If you go back to that uh, quote just one time, you know, conflict is not only incidental, but is required for transformation. It's been said that conflict from discomfort to active disagreement is change waiting to happen. It's change trying to happen. I just love that quote and want to thank you so much for uh, letting me be here today and um, thank you. Thank you so much, Livia. Um, and we do uh, have one question in the Q&A, um, so we can start there. Um, and I encourage uh, the attendees to chime in um, if you've been inspired by something um, or perhaps uh, you know, the additional discussion will inspire a question in you. Um, so our question that we have is how do we distinguish or delineate the idea of sp safe spaces from being comfortable discomfort? So if you have, um, I'm happy to start just because I think that might yeah. go to, to a couple of my rules. Sorry to jump mm -hmm. in. So <laughs> No, no, I think, no. I think that might've been directed at you. Penny, so. Okay. Um, the reason why we uh, recommend two things when you begin it, if you begin as a group of people, um, you know, or an agency or a board, it's great to have a facilitator who has some experience having these types of conversations. Um, and because there's a lot to hold, right? And so um, you can also look at just these rules for the road, quote unquote, there's many community agreements, uh, conversation agreements that have been established to really have these conversations. And so if nothing else, um, you know, if you can find the rules for the road, you find some that really speaks to your group, what you would do is you would develop them, you would adapt them, you would vote on them, and then you would have someone whose sole job it is to make sure that they're reinforced and enforced, because that's when you start having these safe um, conversations. Once you have safe space where you can have some of these uh, uncomfortable conversations, practice is really what starts making it happen. I mean, the more comfortable you get to be uncomfortable, the more times you have to practice it, the easier it becomes. And I don't want to say easy as it goes away, but you understand that it's hard and you grow for it, from it. The questions are now starting to come in. <laughs> so that's great. Um, and I think I think there's going to be quite a few for you in particular, Olivia. So I hope you don't mind being put on the spot. Um, how do we know when we are no longer racists as individuals and as organizations? Uh, and are there metrics that people use to measure their progress? 
So when we talk to uh, African Americans, when we talk to Native Americans uh, about this, um, and when we look and, and we talk at people who really try to promote racial equity as uh, their life's work, what we, we hear are, you know, it has taken 12 generations uh, uh, of slavery in this country. You know, that's what we're living with, 12 generations where they, we are living with either slavery or the effects of slavery. It's only in the last 50 years we have not, uh, you know, had law, had, you know, had a law that actually, you know, um, got rid of it, right? So, it, and um, if you really look at, at uh, you know, how many years you have been with uh, slavery in this country, you should expect as many years before we are out of it. So they talk about they talk about twelve generations. It will not be done in our lifetime. It cannot because it's impacted all of us. So when will you know? Uh, you won't ever get there. Not in our lifetime. That doesn't mean that you're not always trying to get there, but you won't know. Um, some metrics that you can you know that maybe look at um, providing some uh, benchmarks. If you have uh, a staff that is mostly white and you're serving uh, mostly uh, communities of color, um, if you start having 50 to 75% of your leadership being people of color rather than white, that is one measuring stick, right? You could really say who, the people who are most impacted by the issue are in leadership positions in your agency, that would be one metric, one measuring stick. There are many others, right? It could be, you know, our actions you're taking to uh, serve or provide services to people um, resulting in outcomes that uh, increase the social determinants of health for the person, you know, their, their wages, their housing, their whatever it is, uh, you know, are those kind of outcomes increasing? You know, and again, you would define those metrics with the communities you're trying to serve. Uh, Native Americans will tell us it's seven generations. So you shouldn't expect to no longer be in racist in any of our lifetimes. We are just, we have a lot of years and generations to still overcome. Okay. Um, we have um, another question. This is, a, this is one that I've actually wondered myself as well. Um, how can we ensure that BIPOC folks are included in decision-making and diversity, equity, and inclusion work without making people feel tokenized. So when I first uh, got introduced to all of you at uh, the Watership Action Alliance, and I heard that Melissa was on the board, because I know Melissa, and I heard that she was the only person who is non-white, in my understanding, or she's a Native American, then um, what you do is you become aware of that, saying, oh, we have one person, right? And uh, so awareness is the first step. And then you make a commitment collectively to increase the number of people who are non-white by 50% in, you know, 50% of your board should be, you know, something else than other than white in three years, five years, one year, whatever it is. You make a commitment to going out and finding folks to being in leadership positions. That is one of the strategies. Great. Um, and I'd like to actually shift to a question for um, Melissa. Um, so if you're there, Melissa can pop up for us. I can. There you go. All right. Um, so uh, this question is a, a great question. Um, I spend a lot of time at oh sorry I spend a lot of time at herring runs and have many times witnessed people who are not law enforcement or town officials ask people who are gathering herring are you a tribal member will you show me your tribal card and uh, uh, the questioner asks you know is this I can imagine that this is frustrating for a tribal member to have to deal with every time they want to exercise their tribal rights is there anything I can do as a bystander in a situation like this that would be helpful to the people gathering herring? Well, you know, it is very frustrating. You know, sometimes my son might be down there and he's on his lunch break. So he'll be approached and then he has to stop to give his ID. 
you know, my suggestion would be to just avoid it. And as someone in the public, I know it might be tempting to want to, you know, defend the tribal person because you know how frustrating it is. But I think for your safety and everyone else, it would be best to leave it to the officials. So what we do is if somebody's irate, conflict, we just call the police department and have them and they come and they usually can handle it. So I would not suggest you intervene just for your own safety, if that makes uh, that makes sense. We, we appreciate it, obviously, but we wouldn't want to, you to put yourself in a dangerous situation because you wanted to help. Thank you. All right, this is another uh, question uh, for Livia, I believe. Um, so I think environmental justice starts with understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can I, I can bring my board members through a DEI workshop, uh, but how do I expose my thousand members to uh, <laughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion or environmental justice? So I think uh, one of the ways to start is really by starting, uh, you know, with yourself and your own uh, small team first. You know, if you take the steps and go on, a, commit to a journey to, for the next year, do everything you can to uh, do some of the internal work and also to put in place a commitment to some action steps externally, and you take a year to map that out, then at that point, you will be much better equipped to say, okay, how do I now really look at getting everyone uh, more exposed to this? And what can be my role? Uh, what can be my role with uh, people of color, communities of color, who many uh, communities of color now have agencies that you know, provide this kind of support. Um, and uh, you find allies with uh, you know, white people as well and maybe you co-present. We find that if you have a white person and a non-white person co-present or co-speaker, co-advocate, uh, it can help um, a lot um, because you're able to acknowledge both experiences. Um, this one, I think perhaps a couple of people might be able to answer. Um, so my company's black resource group invited a speaker who made some folks uncomfortable they could not handle the truth. And now the group has to have every speaker, presentation slide and topic approved by the leadership. How do we fight against this censorship and put guidelines in place to prevent this from happening again? Sarah, I, I, I'd take that one. Okay, great, that would be great. The, the, the trouble with that situation is that you don't have a whole lot of authority to uh, challenge the upper levels of management in your company. The only thing that I can suggest and the only thing that makes sense to me is that, I mean, you're not, you're not going to change people's minds by giving them facts. You're going to change their minds by moving them, by including them in the process, or by making it easy for them to see the future. And I think that the future that we're looking at is the default setting right now. And the default setting, I think a lot of us can agree, is heading down a slippery slope. And in, in my, my presentation, I talked about problem solving. And I've, I've had a lot of experience in problem solving with my former company. And that problem solving benefits from having a diversity of input. There's no question about that. And we don't do that well to start with. Uh, we can do it better by being more inclusive. And to make the long story short, I think that the benefit that management can see or should be able to see is a better way forward for the company. And if it takes talking about 
profits improving because you've solved a major production problem or a major marketing problem. That's what you've got to convince people to do. And that's, that's not going to be easy. I'm afraid not going to be easy. It does work. I know it works. Um, we have, we had technicians, we had engineers, we had marketing people, we had research people involved in problems. And personally, I've led groups that have solved 25-year-old problems that were worth a million dollars. Did I know which way we were going to go before I started? Of course not. I wasn't uncomfortable with that. But the ideas that came from the multitude of diverse people are, are what make this work uh, and should be a motivator for doing it. Or you can do the Armageddon thing. If we don't do it, think of where we're going to end up. You can see where we're going. You can see it. Thanks for the question. That's a great question. I, I just want to acknowledge that if there's a black resource group uh, that is part of the company, it would be interesting to look at what is their authority or who kind of is the champion for that black resource group. and. Um, you know, do they have power to report directly to the board or what, what's the kind of, you know, reporting up and is there a way to strengthen that authority that they have so that they are less centered? Uh, you know, so that's one strategy we've seen. So just, just a thought, we're also happy to provide any, you know, help afterwards or ideas if you're interested. And, and sticking with the theme of uh, organizations trying to take uh, some concrete action. Uh, we have another question. What would you recommend as a budget in either money or hours for small organizations, um, uh, presumably ones that uh, it says under 500,000 or even under 20,000, so those must be uh, annual budgets for these organizations uh, that are mostly volunteers um, regarding how to engage in this work. So how, how can this work be funded or supported? Um, directly. So kind of the principle that we, we talk about and that I mentioned in our remark is that if you have priorities for your organizations, what, whatever those priorities are and they, you know, for, for funding and you identify them each year or every three year, three years or five years, whatever it is, your, your kind of your funding setting. You know, so if you know, you're looking at expanding your volunteer base by 50%, or if you're, you know, trying to, you know, do whatever it is your priority is, if racial equity, promoting racial equity is a priority you want to pursue, you want that priority to have the same uh, amount of resources supported that, than any other priority. So if you have two or three and racial equity is one of, one of them, they should have the same as the other two. So let's say you're able to have 15,000 to research and development or to looking at, uh, you know, how to uh, achieve some of your priorities. So in racial equity is one of them, they should, they should get 5,000. So it, it's really looking at that, you know, because you want to prioritize it on equal terms with your other priorities. You don't want it to be an add on. You want to make sure it's something that transform and not just gets its own little department over here because then it won't transform everything you do. See, I um, are you raising your hand, Don? Go ahead. I am. Yeah, I I am president of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association, and we we've had a number of problems that that we've uh, looked at together. And the good news about this particular problem is that. Many people believe it's getting better. Another good news is that it's a multi-generational problem, so you don't necessarily have to rush it. So I, I think that adjustment of your group to the process, namely the value of problem solving, the value of talking together, the value of reasoning together, has to be judged as to how fast it can go. If you, if you move it too fast, you're going to lose it. If you move it too slow, you're going to lose it. So I, I think there has to be a sense of how fast your, your group can move to absorb all of this. I mean, consider how fast, I mean, it, it took me 
probably a couple of years to even get to the point where I, I can uh, say that I've passed Equity 101. So uh, given that people haven't done this kind of thing before commonly, I think you have to feel your way through it as to how fast that it can be absorbed because the process in, in initially in my sense is, is more important than the, the product. Otherwise the product will never happen. So that's my comment. All right. Um, I don't know. Do you have something else to say about that, Livia? No. Okay. Um, I have a, a question of my own, uh, which is that in addition to uh, dealing with issues of racism, many organizations are also dealing with issues of gender, LGBTQ issues, um, and religion, and uh, trying to balance all of those intersectional issues in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, what is the best way to, uh, to kind of get to what Don was saying about not moving too fast, a, a good way to make progress on all of these issues um, intersectionally without um, overwhelming everyone, uh, particularly since many of these organizations uh, may have uh, board members who are um, really just coming up to speed on many of these issues. Yeah, so, so it's addressing it, intersectionality. I yeah, so yeah, I think this might be getting into uh, racial equity 102 a little bit. <laughs> oh, we, okay. we may need our chief equity and impact officer to at C4 to really say this eloquently, but um, to try to paraphrase her, you know, she would <clears throat> talk about, you know, racism, you're right, intersects all of this, right? And, and racism really underlies all of this. And so um, if we can take this moment in time with all the uh, happenings of 2020, right? Uh, and, and look at saying, okay, there's a real opportunity because there's increased awareness to address racism. Let's really take that opportunity because if we start to address racism, you will also impact all where it intersects with everything else. Because if you really look at disaggregating that data and you look to say, what is it you're trying to do for the people who are the furthest who are from you know, achieving the desired results? If you can really look at that, um, you know, you will start to also then say, okay, maybe I can't get to talking about uh, disadvantaged youth, or maybe we can't get to talk about, you know, an, another uh, subgroup um, for year one, because we're going to start with racism. But maybe you do that in year two, or year three, or the year four. So trying to do it all at once for the purposes of making everyone feel included uh, is probably not a good strategy because you need to get some wins. You need to be able to, uh, as a collective, if you're working with a group of people to achieve some of those wins, you need to also be able to identify some strategies towards an identified problem you're trying to overcome. Um, so it's not that you're not concerned about other groups and other issues, of course you are. Um, racism intersects with all of them. So by really starting with that as a foundation, you also will eventually work on the other ones, but you may not doing it kind of right on to start with. And sort of to, to another sort of question to that point um, that I'm going to sort of paraphrase, paraphrase sorry. Um, someone asks, are different cultures the same as different races? And, um, you know, how, how do we address um, what is actually culturalism versus racism? So different cultures is not the same as different races. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can say that with a, a lot of comfort level, um, yeah. you know, so um, races is a social construct. There is only one human race, right? And so that is what science tells us. It's, it's a difference in skin pig pigmentation. And so uh, there are a lot of different cultures. So I told everyone in the beginning, I came from Denmark and so, um, when I was living in Denmark, I was not a white person, right? I was Danish uh, it, it, as opposed to Swedish or German, right? I wasn't white. 
And uh, pe people who live in Africa who are black, they're not black people. They, that's not how they talk to them about themselves, right? So, so this white and black, you know, race concept, uh, you know, even that is not the same from country to country, right? So, uh, but the Danish culture and the American culture and the Ethiopian culture, they're very, very different. The Native American culture, right? So, um, and they have people with different skin pigmentation, right? The levels of skin pigmentation. So they're very different. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Great. Um, are there, uh, and we have just about two more minutes. So if, uh, if there's are any final questions, um, that would be, um, that'd be great. Um, just a comment that someone uh, says, it sounds like we need to get rid of the word racism. <laughs> Is that a misnomer? Um, uh, I don't know if you want to very quickly address that in our last two minutes, Livia. In a way, yes, except racism, if you look at the glossary now, because it's not only interpersonal, but it's also structural, it's also, you know, it, it, it exists in so many different ways uh, and they're perpetuated in so many different ways because it's no longer just, you know, uh, being skin picked. I mean, it's not only about how we interpersonally look at each other. There's so much structural racism that we can't get rid of it quite yet. Race, right. we maybe should get rid of race, but not racism. Okay. Well, I think that's a, a, a great note to end on. Um, I would really like to thank everyone who attended this workshop as well as uh, any of the other two. Uh, I hope that you have learned something and that you uh, feel a little bit more empowered to uh, take a step in your own life and in your own organization toward anti-racism or even just understanding the concepts of um, environmental justice and anti-racism a little bit better. Um, there are a lot of big steps and little steps that we all uh, can be taking. And, um, you know, I, I hope it's not uh, you're not feeling overwhelmed and that you're just feeling very empowered uh, to help out and uh, and go forth from this workshop and um, improve uh, your life and, and the lives of others. So um, again, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you, uh, Don Williams and Melissa Peretti and Livia Davis for your contributions today. Um, thank you to um, our other speakers from our other workshops. Um, and please take a moment to fill out our evaluation. The link is in the, um, the chat. That will help us understand uh, a little bit better what you got out of our workshops. Um, we've really enjoyed putting these sessions together. Um, I think that when we were sort of formulating this, uh, we had no idea just how, how wonderfully it would grow and um, the wonderful perspectives that we would end up hearing. Um, and thank you to everybody for your questions as well. They've been really helpful in shaping uh, the discourse in not only this workshop, but all of the others. So um, I hope that it is as nice out where you are as it is where I am and that you can go out and enjoy the rest of this uh, lovely spring day. So thank you very, very much.